All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy to have everybody on the call today. We're we're uh, it's a kind of a timely uh, call as well. I think a timely, uh, great time to have this conversation around uh, trying to uh, figure out how we're going to restart our businesses, considering uh, the Ontario government has um, has uh, announced stage two this week. Um, so, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a in a bit, but. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. I'll do a quick introduction of myself and my experience. Um, I've been doing occupational health, public health safety for 30 years now in a variety of sectors. Uh, most recently, I was the senior director of, uh, of health safety environment for Sanofi Pasteur, which is a, a vaccine manufacturing company in Toronto, where we handled uh, level two, uh, risk group two and risk group three agents um, biological agents such as polio and, and diphtheria and tetanus. Um, so I've got quite a bit of a biosafety experience, at least in the past five years. Prior to that, I've held positions at Air Canada and Perilator, where I was uh, part of the teams that did the response to H1N1 pandemic in 2010 and, and Perilator, the 2003 SARS uh, uh, response team. And over the years, I've taken a lot of courses in um, biocontainment and epidemics and uh, infectious diseases. Um, sort of an expertise I have developed and, uh, and a real interest in this area. So that's a little bit, a little bit about me. Um, you know, this is an area now that I'm consulting in, and uh, it's pretty timely uh, to start consulting in this area, considering what is what's happened since January. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to cover today. Um, with um, with uh, what's going on today, this is a quickly evolving uh, pandemic, and it's it's uh, a challenge to keep up with on the best of days. But uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's something that you know we need to sort of start from the beginning, which is sort of understanding the threat. We, you know, what is what is happening? What is the threat? What is this virus? How are we going to return to work? So today, I'm going to try to cover how to recognize uh, what the true threat is, uh, specifically around returning to work understand the importance uh, of an industry specific or a workplace specific plan to reopen. Um, I've talked to several clients in the last uh, few weeks who are sort of struggling with you know, what does that plan look like so I'll try to cover a little bit about that today. I want you to recognize the importance of vulnerable employees and this is one of the things that has come up, come through loud and clear here is when you see the data that I'm going to present there are certain people who are more at risk than others. Um, and we also want you to, to have a basic understanding and sort of know how to assess this uh, this infectious disease risk. And specifically in that area, what I'll talk about today is how to use risk assessment or risk management approach, how to identify measures to prevent, minimize, and respond to workplace transmission. And one of the things that I'm, I'm advising everybody now is be prepared for a case. Uh, this is not something you can prevent completely we are going to see cases and we already have seen cases in the workplace so you need to be prepared and lastly um, what I would like you to hopefully walk away with this today from this today is an ability to improve your own uh, COVID health and safety plan and to be able to reopen your business sustainably um, which means keep it open, avoid outbreaks in the workplace, avoid work refusals and major disruptions. So really what we want to try to do today is to help you uh, improve what you've already done because what I'm finding is most employers have already developed um, COVID safety plans. So l let me start with something I mentioned a little earlier. You know, we, we have seen cases of outbreaks uh, in workplaces. As you can see on this, uh, the in the US, uh, Tyson's Perry plant uh, had an outbreak. We, we've seen outbreaks in beef plants in Alberta. Um, we've seen outbreaks, uh, there, was, there were several cases reported about a month or so ago in a Costco in the greater Toronto area. And you'll see that in the, the bottom picture here, that this is from the CBC uh, a couple weeks ago, well, May 29th. And you know they're suggesting that manufacturing plants, grocery stores, delivery companies, all have outbreaks already, and we probably should prepare for more of those. And one of the things that we've learned from international experience, and particularly in South Korea, is that as they opened up, they started to see cases spike up. So, you know, as I mentioned, 
today earlier the ontario government has has decided to move to stage two which is going to open allow more businesses to open so we need to be prepared for when this happens over the coming weeks we're going to see more cases and the in the the key here is to to try to mitigate or minimize the number of cases that we see in workplaces because that's where i think the opportunity lies and where you're most interested and Doug, do you do you expect to see cases where employees pass it in the workplace or pass it on to other employees back when everything's opening up? Yeah, absolutely. We we've um, we've seen from our experience and since this began, and and we've seen it from international experience that once you bring people together, and I'll talk a little bit about this later. Once you bring people together, um, we start to see spread. So you know as and this is why the Ontario government has taken a very measured approach to this and they're opening certain types of businesses but not allowing others to open as much as we can try to to uh, segregate people and and wear masks I still think to, to answer your question yeah we're, we're going to see outbreaks and cases in in employ in in workplaces thank you um so let, let, let me talk a little bit about what if we don't get it right what is the cost of getting it wrong um, one of the things we, we've seen is, and I think everybody's seen this, you look at the numbers globally, we're, we're probably over 400,000 cases now. Um, in Canada, I just checked the numbers this morning, um, deaths in Canada right now uh, are over 7,800, so that continues to grow. Um, we've seen pain and suffering, we've seen many people uh, hospitalized, uh, our hospitalization now, uh, or ICU, um, uh, and, and hospitalization rate has continued to climb. Um, hospitalized in Canada right now, we're looking at about 9,200 people. And so when you think about this, um, whether it's deaths, pain and suffering, people being ill and having to stay home, um, there's the human side of it, there's also the business side of it. We know that 40% of Canadian retailers have closed. Um, we're seeing uh, bankruptcies now, uh, several bankruptcies, particularly in the US, um, have been reported. So if you don't get this right and if you don't reopen properly and you do have more cases, um, you know, we, we have to be prepared for that. And how will that affect your corporate reputation, uh, workers' comp claims, um, you know, and it, this has been a massive and will continue to be a massive disruption to businesses because it diverts the attention of management. And uh, you know, so there's there's a lot riding on getting this right when you reopen your business. So one of the things that we've seen a lot of is um, a lot of guidelines. And uh, um, if you look at the Ministry of Labor in Ontario or the WSPS, um, the CDC in the US, uh, WorkSafe BC, um, you know, there, there's all kinds of regulators and organizations publishing guidance and recommendations. The problem with these are that you can't implement them in, in your workplaces. So, you know, look at the pictures of the, the dental hygienist. How, how is she going to actually physical distance? She can't. She, to do her job, she has to be in the mouth of the patient. Um, are we going to be able to medical screen people at the Costco? Probably not. Now, recently, I actually went to a grocery store and uh, I was surprised to see that they were taking temperatures of people coming in. I'm not sure it's a particularly effective uh, measure, but they're trying. Uh, some people can work at home, but the miner in the picture here obviously can't work at home unless that uh, miner has a very big deposit of gold under their house, which I don't think anybody, many do. Um, the, the chicken uh, processing line in the bottom left corner. Um, how do you postpone work or postpone projects when you're a, a business that has to provide food for, for Canadians? Um, you know, one of the guidelines they've put out is stop meeting face to face. Well, you know, if you're getting in the elevator to go to the 42nd floor of the TT Tower in Toronto, uh, I don't know how you do that now. Um, and then lastly, if you look at that picture of the auto manufacturing on the right hand side, you want to limit the number of pe pe people in the workplace, but some jobs are designed so that you have to have, in this case, two people working together to do the job. So one of the challenges that I'm hearing a lot of from, from my clients is, these are all great guidelines, but how do I do this? Because I just can't in some cases. Mm -hmm. And Doug, particularly medical screening, 
Do you think that that's effective in a place like a grocery store um, being put on by the management of something that's open to the public? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. That's a big question. A lot of people are asking that question around how do we screen our employees? How do we screen our clients? Um, whether it's a grocery store or, you know, any other public, any other uh, business where you have the public coming in, um, you know, it's a challenge. Um, and for those of you who've been to a grocery store lately, we're seeing wide variety of of what's happening. Some grocery stores are screening. Um, and And my answer to that would be, uh, it, it's probably not a bad measure if done properly, but we have to remember, and I'll show you this in, in a couple of slides, um, people are infectious well but for days before they actually have any type of symptom. Um, so I'm not completely sold on, on um, doing the, the temperature screening or screening for, for these types of things at the door for a grocery store in that type of environment. Um, and really one the way to look at it is it it's it's maybe helpful but it's only going to be one line of defense and you need multiple lines of defense to to help you um, the, the um, if, if you think about you know moving on from sort of the the screening at the at the door you know one of the things I recommend to to clients is you need to start thinking about the jobs or where people are being exposed in the workplace or at the workplace so maybe screening at the door is going to be helpful for those workplaces where you don't have a lot of public involvement but i'll tell you I, a, a quick story about a client i'm working with a large teaching hospital in in toronto who has been screening quite rigorously um, but they just recently had someone who um, tested positive and the screening didn't work. And now they have close to 100 people that may need to be uh, isolated. So you, know, you really need to look at it on a business to business perspective. And, you know, one of the things I highly recommend is a risk based approach to looking at this and a very workplace specific approach to, to start. You really need to stress test your existing plans to see if they're going to work. And what a risk-based approach will enable you to do is to do to create very targeted risk controls and 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 be more specific with your controls. It'll also give you uh, give the employees, the managers, the unions, the board of directors, it'll give those people confidence that you're taking a very targeted and a very strategic approach to this. It also is a good way to to support the existing business and crisis plans, which most people have implemented by now. And the last thing I'll talk about too is it's it's going to help you to ensure compliance and due diligence because we are going to start to see the Ministry of Labor and other uh, authorities out there looking. So they're going to be looking for a plan that is specific to your workplace. I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit now about you know kind of the data behind this and 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 what we know about this pandemic about the virus because that that you really need to know that to develop effective plans one of the things we're seeing and when you look at the demographics is that the distribution of infection is actually quite equal and quite the same from different age groups so what we're seeing is anybody with the exception of of children so anybody working age and above are pretty it's, we, we see pretty much the same infection rate in all of those folks. And we see a bit higher infection rate in, in older people in, in, in homes, but that's more to do with the, where they're situated. But what we're also seeing is that the older you are, um, particularly over the age of 60, 65, and if you have comorbidities or polymorbidities, meaning you have medical conditions that are, are complicating it, you appear to be much more likely to um, have more severe symptoms and more severe and are much more risk at, for death. There's an interesting study that came out of um, Johns Hopkins uh, or a report out of Johns Hopkins recently that um, just the end of May that suggested when they looked at people who were hospitalized, patients who were hospitalized, nearly half of them had a body mass index of greater than 30, meaning it appears to be very hard on obese people. So that's another key factor that they hadn't seen, in it, but they're starting to st realize that obesity, heart disease, people who were immunocompromised with cancer or cancer treatment, those types of, of health problems uh, significantly increase your risk of A, hospitalization and B, death. But what we're also seeing is that 85% of the Canadian cases uh, are 
in Ontario and Quebec. So we're starting to see that this is very much a localized kind of thing. And if you look at the data, I looked at the data this morning, right now in Ontario, we have 603 people hospitalized. Right now in British Columbia, we have 16 people hospitalized. Mm -hmm. um, Alberta is 44. So we're, we see a, a very strong difference between provinces. And, and it's important now too to look at it from a within Ontario you need to look at your own community because we do see hot spots in some areas so for example um, if you look at Peel region which is Mississauga in Ontario the last the case they've reported is June 6th but if you look at the Algoma Public Health um, which is in, up in Sault Ste. Marie and where Garden River First Nations is located the last case they had was uh, almost a month ago May 11th and Sudbury, Sudbury and District Public Health is reporting the last case they've had is May 14th. So when you look at those areas where they, they've gone a month without cases, but then you look at Mississauga or Vaughan and other local communities, we're continuing to see spread in those communities. So it's really important that you think about that as you develop your plans, you to think about your own workplace. The first question is what's going on in our community? Are we in one of those hotspots? And Doug, is there anything specific that can be done to protect vulnerable employees? I know you mentioned people who are obese or who have uh, multiple medical conditions or maybe older. Yeah, the, uh, the, the first thing we need to do uh, is we need to identify them. And uh, particularly in the workplace, what I'm encouraging uh, everybody I'm talking to, to is, because I know it's hard to do this sometimes, but you need to try to reach out to your employees and ask them, if they have a, a, a medical condition, and one of those medical conditions that I mentioned, whether it's heart disease or pulmonary issues, whether it's a, you know, those types of problems that, that, that we typically see, we need to identify them or have them self-identify. And then that's a start. If they can self-identify, then you know you have someone you need to protect. Now, you need to do that in a way that protects their privacy, and there's a way to do that properly. Um, the, the first step I would take is, is ask those individuals to work at home. Um, they're, the, they're the last one we want we're in the workplace if we have a workplace outbreak. So, so there's some of those steps. First, identify them. Second, try to get them some support and accommodate them in a role. And this is where the duty to accommodate comes in. You want to accommodate them in a role that is going to reduce their risk of infection. And as I said, one of the best ways to do that is to have them work at home. Secondly, you might want to set up the workplace to have a separate area for them, to, that individual to work in, so that they're isolated from everyone else. So there's a bunch of steps you can put in place, but it really comes down to starting with trying to identify them and working with them and asking them you know, what they need to do to be what they would like to see to be accommodated. It's, that's one of the most important things you need to do in your workplace is try to identify those people who are over 60 and who have a comorbidity or polymorbidity, meaning they've got some sort of health uh, problem already that may make them great, at greater risk. And, and that kind of ties into this next slide because when you look at this virus itself, the, the, the virus is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, what we see with this is, it, everyone knows it's a it's a new virus um but it's um a couple of things with it number one is it's it's an enveloped virus and i'll come back to that later because it's a very important point um but the incubation period of this virus is typically about four to six days so once a, a person in the workplace becomes exposed to someone else who who is infectious they typically see symptoms onset in about four to five to six days we know that people are infectious one to three days and some say as much as four before the symptoms even appear so you may have somebody walking around your workplace right now who is infecting people and spreading the virus we've also seen that the the viral load in the pharynx is the highest the pharynx is the back of the nose the back of the nasal and the back of the throat at the highest at about four days so we know that people are very infectious in sort of day one two three before symptoms and day four or five, six, sort of seven, and then the, the viral load starts to decrease over time. So that, that's an important thing to think about is how do we create plans to, to prevent the infectious infection or the transmission in those early days? And as we've said, you know, the older, older and those who have the underlying medical conditions are the ones that we need to think about in that period. How do we keep them protected in that first week or two? Um, we have also seen that 95% uh, uh, of the deaths 
um, in Ontario uh, are people 60 years of age or older. So, you know, this may be a time where we have to have conversations with those people, those workers who are over 60 and say, this is really serious. You know, <laughs> this is not something to play around with. And, you know, one of the other studies has suggested that we many people may be infected with no symptoms at all and may never develop symptoms, then that they're suggesting that maybe we may see up to 50% of people not developing symptoms and being uh, infectious. So there, there seems to be a belief that there's a lot of people out there walking around infected and maybe spreading this, this illness uh, without even knowing it, and then they may never develop symptoms. They may just pass and they may not even recognize it. So it's important to think about that as, you know, th this important time period is sort of day, you know, one, two, three before symptoms appear, and then a week or two after that. One of the um, <clears throat> things that we need to also think about is how does this transmit? Well, there's a very simple way to look at it. And these are five of very important factors that I would ask you to think about as you develop your plans, as you're working on your plans. The first thing that increases the risk of transmission is one person close to another. So if you've got two people working shoulder to shoulder, side by side, face to face, you're increasing their risk of transmitting. The second risk factor is groups of people. The more people we put together, the more likely you are to have infection. The third one, which a lot of people don't think about is duration of infection, or sorry, duration of interaction. How long do people stay together? And I like this little equation that came out of one of the articles I read, which is, Successful infection equals the exposure to the virus, the exposure to a person who's infected, times time. So there's a correlation here with time, which is very important. The shorter duration the, you have with an infected person, the less likely you are to. And the fourth one is type of activity. You know, if you're at a sporting event or you've got people cheering and yelling and they're, they're spewing droplets out of their mouth, they're, you're much more likely to be infected than you are if you're sitting quietly having dinner with someone. And then lastly, the fifth and most important, one of the most important factors that you have to look at that increases risk is the physical layout, the physical environment. How close are people together? And this is why we want six feet or two meters apart. Um, you also want to look at your air handling systems. Do you have uh, air handling systems that are blowing droplets in a certain direction? Um, you want to think about the degree of protection, meaning do you have uh, walls between each other? Do you have cubicles or are you all sitting around a big table? And, you know, one of the, the, the interesting things that's come out of this is this concept of um, what they call hoteling or uh, this change of the work environment where we try to put people all together in one big room to improve collaboration. I think that concept is dead. I don't think we're ever going to see that continue. Um, I think we're going to make a move back to offices and cubicles to separate people, and, and that may be for the next few years. So think about that in terms of how your workplace or your, 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 where your employees or where your clients are, how that's designed. And that's why we're starting to see a lots of plexiglass put up in things like grocery stores. The, interestingly, the Ontario um, government has define close contact as face-to-face -face conversations for 15 minutes or being in the same room for two hours. So there's that duration piece. If, the, if you're in a room for more than two hours with someone, then they're considering that close contact. So why risk management? Um, what, one of the things I, I would suggest that you need to think about from a risk perspective is, you know, this is one way to help us protect our employees. There's other ways, but this is just one. Um, this is a key part of anybody, any management system. If you have a health and safety management system, such as on the right, I've shown a, a graphic of ISO 45001 model on the bottom. Um, this is a key part of your management system. It supports your business continuity. It will make sure, as I said in the beginning, that you restart or remain open in a sustainable way. And as I would mentioned, there are several regulators, and particularly the the WorkSafe BC has has said that they're requiring workplaces that reopen to have a COVID safety plan posted in the workplace, and they're requiring the first step of that to be to assess the risks in your workplace. And even in Ontario as well, which is typically not as, uh, as prescriptive, um, they're saying the employer is required to have every take every reasonable precaution, but that includes doing a risk assessment to determine what parts of the job site uh, and, you might be great at greater risk or where they may have more contact. 
and as well on the US OSHA regulations, they're requiring that you do a hazard assessment um, if you're gonna provide people with PPE. So this is, the risk management approach will help you comply with the legal requirements. And Doug, um, are there workplace specific risks as well that people should be looking out for? Yeah, the the um, what we're seeing right now is is not so much workplace specific regulations or or laws, but um, many industry sectors have issued their own guidelines. Um, and there are some uh, industries, such as the gaming industry, where they actually uh, have established requirements for them, and they're going to apply those through their licensing regime. So. You really do need to to be in contact with your industry association and and ask them and check their website to see what what's available to support you, but also what is expected because we we are going to start to see certain industries will establish requirements and guidelines that are very specific to your business. It's interesting. Um, this slide I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, um, the threats. Um, and again, sort of expanding on that idea of what increases the risk of, ex of infection. You know, one of the things we know is that, as I said in the beginning, the local community is, is, and is so important to look at. If, if you're in um, Sudbury or if you're in uh, Sault Ste. Marie, um, you don't have an outbreak right now. It seems to have died off, so you're at less risk. But if you're a Peel region or Vaughan or uh, Toronto, you, you are in an area where you're experiencing uh, increasing rates of, uh, of infection in the community, that, that's really important to look at. Um, so these, these list, this list I've created up here, and I won't go through all of them, actually comes out of a risk assessment tool that we're going to share with you at the end of this. But it's, it, and it comes from the, the government guidelines around what they think uh, increases your risk. So um, if your workplace is in, a, in an area where you have a lot of pedestrian traffic, um, where people are, have close contact, we've talked about that. You have high touch areas. I've done this, um, this tool, actually I introduced this tool with another organization, I've got about 30 respondents. And one of the things that has come up really loud and clear is that a lot of companies have identified that they have pinch points um, where people tend to uh, come together like, and high, have high touch areas like turnstiles and elevators. And that's gonna be a real challenge. And as we've said, the activities that may pro promote, promote transmission are important, um, but one of the most important things is to make sure that you identify those jobs, A, where you have people who are vulnerable, and B, uh, where you have frequent and close contact, um, you know, whether that be a school or a retail store. So there's several factors that you need to think about. And as I said, that I'll talk about in, in the end that I actually have included in a tool to allow you to self-assess your, your, your situation. So, so one of the things I've had some real success with and a couple of clients is um, a biological risk assessment tool that I've used. And this is something that um, has really been helpful for, I, I had a conversation with one of my clients the other day who had gone through this and he said, you know, one of the most important uh, benefits of this tool was that it's changed the way their senior management are thinking about risk and about safety in general. And what we're able to do is in, they have a warehouse in um, a warehouse in Vancouver and in Toronto. And what we're able to do is evaluate in each of those locations about 30 different jobs. And in some of the cases, we identified jobs that were high risk and that we had to, they had to stop. And in others, we were able to very quickly identify actions or additional treatment risk treatment to reduce the risk, enable them to keep working. So the way this thing works is really, if you think about the, if you look at it from a left to right, and if you look at the example I have with the cashier, something everybody can relate to, um, it allows you to rate the job. Uh, the US OSHA has a job rating class or job classification process that, you, that this uh, tool, it's a spreadsheet tool that enables you to do. We actually do this virtually over the phone uh, using Zoom. And we try to identify the work area, the activities that, for example, in this case, the cashier that he or she is touching items, what might be a hazardous situation, we have at risk or vulnerable people in that area, what are the most likely consequences, and you actually go through and score your risk, uh, rate your risk with a, a, a quantif quantification process, and it, it'll come up as, and I'll show you in the next slide, it's, it's green, yellow, red, and it's very simple. But what the more important part of this is not so much the assessment, but it enables you to start thinking about 
what are some of the actions we can take to prevent or to deal with or respond to these types of uh, infections. And it provides you with a drop down menu of all kinds of different risk uh, um, controls. And it's divided into three categories of risk controls. The first, the first column there is more um, sort of engineering controls and technical controls. The second category of controls are things like what we call administrative controls. And then the last one is, uh, is really what I call human or behavioral. And this is a really important one because we're going to be asking our employees to behave in a certain way, such as social distance and, and do all kinds of things like that. So this tool enables you to kind of identify all kinds of different possible options to, to reduce your risk. And what you end up with at the end of it is a, a green, uh, yellow, red kind of rating. Green means you're good, you don't need to do anything. Red means you better stop the activity and at least temporarily reassess and determine whether you can do something to reduce the level of risk um, to, to at least a yellow. And it'll enable you to think about how can I prevent, which means avoid the or prevent the likelihood of exposure or transmission. But also, most imp more important, uh, very important, is how do I reduce the severity of the impact? As I said in the beginning, you need to be prepared for a case in your workplace. So therefore, you need to think about how do I mitigate that? How do I minimize the infection? I, if I get somebody in my workplace who's infected, I want to make sure that there's not too many people infected. I want to keep that as small as possible. And also, this tool is very effective at helping you identify how you're going to trace these people, track them, your investigations. It'll also help you with work refusals, make people feel more comfortable that you've assessed this properly, um, should prevent grievances. And as I said earlier, it's, a, it's good to be able to demonstrate to the regulator that you've taken a, a due diligence approach here and you've got a very comprehensive plan built based on the risks. So let me switch gears a little now. I've got a couple of slides that will give you a little guidance on how to develop a safety plan. So I've got a five-step method for you. It starts with establishing governance or oversight for this. Second, risk assessment that we just talked about. Third, establish general precautions, things that uh, the guidelines are telling you you should be putting in place. The fourth is workplace-specific precautions, and these really come out of the risk assessment. And then lastly, you need to include capacity building. Make sure you provide the knowledge and the tools to your people to be able to do this successfully. So step one is establishing a team of leaders that are going to provide oversight on this, making sure that they're making the decisions of whether we continue with certain jobs or not. I mentioned risk assessment earlier. This is really important in stress testing, testing your plan, making sure that you've thought of everything you need to think about, and also very important that you have targeted job-specific controls in place. The general precautions are what I said earlier, the guidelines give you. That is social distancing, employee screening, hand hygiene, um, training, cleaning and disinfection is a very important one. So there's lots of guidance out there on the general precautions and most people have these in their plans already. What a lot of people don't have in their plans are the, the job or the workplace specific uh, types of controls. And what we're recommending to people is follow the hierarchy of controls, meaning eliminate. So for those people who are vulnerable, maybe they need to, you need to eliminate the possibility of them being infected in the workplace by saying you're going to work at home. And then work down the hierarchy to eventually, if you can't do any of those others, you're going to end up putting people in PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, that should be your last line of defense. But this approach that, that I recommend is look at the workplace, the physical environment first, then look at the jobs the, and the activities that they're doing, and then look at the worker and how do you make sure that they are performing in a way that you want them to perform. That means wearing the PPE and that's hard. Um, make sure that they're they're doing what the procedures say they're supposed to be doing. And that's, that's a tough one for a lot of organizations. But at the end of that, you're really going to en enable yourself to identify targeted controls. You're going to test those controls and you're going to get people, you know, to make sure that they understand it. You know, one of the things that this kind of risk assessment approach is very good at is helping people to understand what they need to put in place, how to do it, and why they're doing it. Um, so, Doug, once that is you've gone through the entire hierarchy of controls for your workplace is there a system to know that it's effective and that you're mitigating those risks yeah excellent question this is uh, particularly very important when you look at the behavioral component of this 
um, you know, one of the things that uh, is very important is that, you know, you can put all the plans in place and you can write all the procedures and you can tell everybody what to do. If they're not following the procedures, they're not following the plan and they're not doing what they're supposed to do, it's not effective. So one of the things I highly recommend is, um, you know, we, we need to be talking to our management team. We need our managers to be out there monitoring performance. Um, it's more important than ever that we have supervisors on the floor, managers out there on the floor, uh, observing and talking and listening to employees because quite often what I've seen is we will put um, procedures in place so for example one client I'm working with put a process in place a control in place where they wanted to have um, employee social list or physical distance at least two meters but when the supervisor went out on the floor he realized the one job required um, people to come up and down an aisle and the, the aisle was only a meter wide so there was no way in the world they could actually physically distance so it's important that the manager collect that kind of information come back to the team and say hey that's not going to work we need to look at something different so that's one of the most important things you want to do the second important thing to do to make sure that they're effective is audit and we're, we're working now with a client to do a virtual audit um, to actually get a third party or third set of eyes to be checking um, we can do that virtually with uh, with technology today to be able to go out and, sh and look at it and assess it and, and you know, really evaluate and make sure these controls are effective because if they're not effective, you're fooling yourself. And then lastly on the five-step method is capacity building. As I mentioned, we need our employees to have the knowledge, the skills, and the tools they need to be able to do their job competently and safely. That starts with um, uh, you know, general training. Um, uh, you can see on the top right here, the World Health Organization has online videos and training that you can use. Um, that's a good way to start. You want them to be knowledgeable about COVID-19, the risks, uh, and what they need to do to protect themselves. Um, we also need to think about the next normal phase, and, and that requires some management of change. I think what you're going to see is workplaces are going to change for the next couple of years, and jobs are going to change, and we need to be able to think about, need to start to work through a change management process of how do we get people to recognize that their jobs have changed, and maybe changed forever, and we need to do things differently. And everyone needs to know how their jobs changed, how the virus transmits, how it enters their body, meaning you never, you, people have to stop touching their faces. That's how it enters your body. And more importantly, or probably most importantly, how do you prevent it from transmitting from one person to the other? So we need people to be very knowledgeable on these things. And then we need them to, 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 to be knowledgeable on, on the, the procedures and the plans and what we expect of them. Um, lastly, I'll tie this up with, you know, one of the, the things that I, I was working on recently was working with a couple of different clients to find out, uh, you know, how, what, what level of, of maturity are, are these companies with their, their plans. And so what we developed is this, um, this risk assessment. It's a self-assessment tool um, that if you um, take a picture of that uh, QR code on the bottom left, or we'll send you the link, there's a self-assessment link here too. Um, if you click on that link, it'll take you to a 21 question survey that'll evaluate two things. Well, really, it's really it's evaluating your risk and it has questions like, uh, you know, are you in a community that's experiencing um, spread right now? And it's assessing your preparedness. Do you have the right controls in place to, to, to reduce the likelihood of transmission? And it's a simple yes, no. And then it allows you to view your results. And I'll, sh and I'll show you in a minute how those results come up. But it gives you a score and the score is uh, will come up on the top of your report in this case I show a score of 130 out of 300 and then the score is is um, a relative score of 0 to, a, to 300 0 means high risk very low preparedness 300 means you have very low risk and you're very prepared so it, it gives you a chance to be able to kind of benchmark and evaluate your current plans and your current procedures and and see how you're doing <coughs> And you'll see that the questions as you get them are just simple yes, no. So in this case, it is, are there um, restricted points of entrance and exit that force people to be in close proximity or pass through high touch areas? This is something I mentioned earlier. So it'll ask you that question. If you answer, uh, yeah, I have those, it'll give you a little bit more information around why that's an issue. So in this case, it's saying crowding and lines and bottlenecks uh, increase the risk of, of respiratory droplets. 
exposure. And then it'll give you a little bit of guidance on what you might want to think about doing. So in this case, it says uh, enhance your environmental cleaning procedures and protocols with special attention to high touch surfaces. So this survey uh, self-assessment tool will enable you to identify where you're weak and what you can do about it. Thank you. That's all I have. And we, I think we're open for questions. Yes, if you have any questions, you can type them into our chat box on the right hand side or you can um, unmute yourself and ask us uh, through your microphone. And just a response, uh, there was a question earlier. Yes, this deck will be shared. It's being recorded, so we'll have it online and send it out to all the attendees as well. Uh, can you send us the link for the assessment? Yes, we'll send out the link to the assessment along with the recorded webinar. If you want to take a picture of that, um... QR code right now with your camera, you should be able to uh, access it immediately. You can actually do it on uh, a laptop or you can do it on an iPhone or a uh, device. Another question, Doug, is are we free to use all of this information going forward? Absolutely, this is um, what I'm putting out here is public information for you. You're, you're welcome to use it and, uh, and use it in your training, you to, to, to communicate to your management, uh, absolutely. Other questions? Challenges? Anybody have any challenges at their workplace uh, they want some free consulting advice on? Definitely uh, our workplace has a lot of those high touch areas. Um, another question. Some of the information is different from what Johns Hopkins, John Hopkins courses indicate, i.e. exposure or infection timing. I can remember um, I, a lot of the sources that I'm using is John Johns Hopkins. So, uh, you know, it kind of illustrates how we're going to see different uh, information out there. You know, Johns Hopkins is probably one of the most reputable resources I would point you to. Um, if you can send me a note specifically on the, uh, the, the information you think that's conflicting, I'd be happy to take a look at it. Apparently, they said two days before symptoms is infectious timing. Symptoms are infectious timing. Yeah, that's that's an area where um, um, we're seeing a lot of, uh, a, a, of sort of variance. I'm saying that the incubation period is four to six, but the infectious time is one to three days before symptoms occur. And this actually uh, came out of, um, uh, this one came out of the World Health Organization. So. You know, there, there are there as the data comes in, as the research comes in, there's some cases they're sort of shortening that timeline, some they're expanding that timeline. Um, one of the things you're going to see is that you'll see a study and then they'll establish the, the threshold and say it's two days and then you're going to see another study come out and they're going to say it's four days. So this will continue to evolve. Okay. Um, An incubation period, I see somebody mentioned incubation period again we're starting to see a lot of very in opinions on sort of what the incubation period is um it's it's start it seems to be evolving uh, a couple more questions yes the link to the risk assessment will be provided um do you have a copy of the chart that we can use as a template um do you remember which chart if you don't mind just following up is that the biological risk assessment chart that you're speaking of? So, so if it's the biological risk assessment chart, the, the, it's not a chart, it's, it's actually an, an, it's an Excel tool for, be, for doing risk assessments. So it has all the drop down menus and everything in it. And that's what I'm promoting now is um, we can help you do that. It's, uh, it's, there's a fee for that software and for for implementing that so if, if you're interested in that let me know and uh, my email is at the end here um be happy to to set up a call and and talk you through it and explain it to you and 
and show you how to do it. It's something what we found is that if if it's not facilitated properly with a large with the right group of people, it doesn't work very well. So uh, I'd be happy to kind of take it through, take you through it, and explain how how we do it and uh, and how it can be used in your work area. And another question, Doug, would you recommend we supply our workers with reusable PPE as that is more cost effective, but harder to mandate the cleaning or the one-time use masks, which are costly for large organizations? So it, this is, um, it's important to distinguish between PPE and cloth masks. Um, cloth masks are technically really not PPE, but what the, the, authorities are recommending is that workers wear some sort of mask, cloth mask. The intent with that mask is to prevent the droplets coming out of their mouth from going further distance. So um, right now what, what we're saying, what the government's recommendations are is that you need any type of mask. Um, a cloth mask is sufficient for that. Um, the the important part is though as you said is you need to make sure that you have a procedure written for people and that they understand how these need to be cleaned when they need to be cleaned on what frequency and so on that's really important the other thing i would suggest is i know it's costly <clears throat> for masks but um there's a great article um that was in the new yorker recently um written by a doctor out of um, boston's uh, mass general hospital and he did a really good job of explaining the difference between a cloth mask and a surgical mask. And, and it's an interesting, it was an interesting one that I had learned. I didn't know this either, but that uh, the surgical masks are designed not only to protect against large droplets coming out, but they're designed to try to capture the tiny, small droplets, less than three, uh, 0.3 microns. And the reason is that, that they have, they're designed to have sort of a, they said, when you look at that, surgical mask under a uh, microscope it actually looks like candy floss and it's not a physical barrier to the small particles but it's actually uh, when they make them they put electrical charge to that and it's designed to attract the smaller particles to it so the the belief is that a surgical mask would be more protective and better than a cloth mask at capturing those tiny tiny uh, viral particles so, you know, that's something to think about. If you can afford and if you think it's a good idea to have the surgical masks, might be a better way to go. It also depends on your situation and where you are. If, if, if you don't have people in close proximity, if they're, they're all working in a large area, um, cloth mask is fine. Um, if they're in closer proximity, then you maybe want to go to the surgical mask. And then lastly, if they're in close proximity to people who we know are infectious, they obviously want an N95 mask, they need that type of PPE. So the PPE depends on the situation, on the risk of exposure and the risk of transmission in that particular job. And one more question here, Doug, is what would you recommend if an employee who is high risk, over 60, wants to continue to work the front line? We are a healthcare organization. That's a tough one. That's a really tough question because, um, you know, I've, I've done OC Health, uh, overseen OC Health for years, and, and I've seen this again and again where an employee will say, I'm okay, I'm, I'm fine to work in that area. I think you have to balance the employee's rights, the employee's wishes with the risk to the organization. You know, and what I would recommend is if I would first of all have, uh, have them medically assessed by an occupational health nurse or a physician who is familiar, ask them to provide us with a recommendation to start. Secondly, if they're over 60 and they have one or more uh, medical conditions that is listed in what the, um, a lot of the authorities are listing as uh, what puts you at greater risk, um, I would have a tough time as an employer allowing them to come back to work in their normal job on the front line. I would probably, convince them that they need to be accommodated in another job, in a job that's at low, that's lower risk to them. I, I think you have to recognize, as I said, they do have the right and they, you haven't, you know, they want to work, which is great, but if they get sick in the workplace, it's a workers' comp claim, it's, it's on the employer, and, uh, you know, God forbid they end up uh, dying 
uh, because of workplace exposure, you would not want that. So, you know, I, I'd err on the side of caution and say, no, we, we we're going to accommodate you in a job that's less uh, less risky for you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Doug, for giving us all of this information um, and for answering these questions as well. Uh, so everything has been recorded and we'll make sure to send out the risk assessment. A lot of thank yous in the comments, Doug, about how informative and how well of a presenter you are. Um, so we're super grateful to have had you today with Maximus Rose and uh, we look forward to any other questions being addressed to Doug specifically at that DougCubeAtOutlook.com. Right? Great. And with that said, thank we'll you, end the everyone. presentation. Oh, did you have something else to say, Doug? Sorry. No, I just want to say thank you to everyone and uh, good luck and happy to help if, if you want to reach out to me. Fantastic. All right, everyone, enjoy your day. Drink lots of water. It's humid out there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>